If you watch football today, you know that there's been a lot of conversation around the value of the running back position. While owners and front offices refuse to pay their backs what they feel they are worth, it's a sign of how far the game has moved from the smash mouth offenses that were just so prominent three and four decades ago. Now back then, the faces of those teams ran all over the field. Those were the Jim Browns, Gail Sayers, Walter Paytons, OJ Simpsons, and the man we're going to look at today, Marcus Allen. Now if you didn't know, Marcus was an extraordinary player. He played 16 seasons in the NFL with the Los Angeles Raiders and the Kansas City Chiefs. He won a national championship and a Heisman during his time at USC. He was an Elroy and an Elpoy. He won a Super Bowl and was named Super Bowl MVP in the 83 season. And then two seasons later, he was named the league MVP. He's won comeback player of the year. He's been to several Pro Bowls, led the lead in rushing yards, and was the rushing touchdown leader twice, etc, etc. His feats are even more impressive if you think about how much more he could have accomplished if it wasn't for Al Davis, the owner of the Raiders. But we're not here to talk about that. So instead, let's move along so we can reminisce on his love story. As you see, we're continuing our football series throughout the month of October. And if you're new in the pews, this is I'll Tell You What, a weekly podcast that shares the weddings, marriages, and romances of Black figures throughout time. Now, we bask on these relationships not to be messy, but to remind you of the passion in our past and to humanize the people we put on pedestals. Basically, it's all love. Black history. And I'm Ashley, your favorite rock on twos that tells you these stories every week. Welcome to the 21st episode of I'll Tell You What. So because we're reflecting on Marcus Allen's love story, I just want you to know that we'll get there. Trust me. But first, we have to go back to the middle of the 1980s. So several years into his very frustrating career with the Los Angeles Raiders, Marcus met an aspiring model named Katherine Eichstade. Catherine grew up in Wisconsin and set her hopeful blue eyes on a career in California, so she moved to Los Angeles. When they crossed paths, Marcus wasn't looking for anything serious. He said, quote, the right woman was out there somewhere. I not felt any urgency to find her. He'd date here and there, but no one truly impressed him, not until he met Catherine. He met her at a dinner party in 1988. She knew nothing about him, nor football, despite him reaching such professional heights like being a Heisman winner and a Super Bowl MVP by that time. But there was something about her. They would keep in touch after that but actually wouldn't go in their first date until months later. And when they finally did, it went so well that they continued to date and later he invited her to move into his condo by the start of the next season. Marcus said, quote, not only did her presence take my mind off my problems with the writers, but the more I was around her, the more convinced I became that I'd met the person with whom I wanted to spend the rest of my life. They dated for several years and Catherine got a first-hand look at the workplace trauma that Marcus experienced. You see, by the 1990 season, Marcus was barely playing at the level he was at previously. And that's not a, oh, he was so riddled with injuries, he just wasn't his old self. No, he had a hater boss named Al Davis that instructed Art Shell and the coach staff to purposely keep Marcus on the bench, allegedly, and he wouldn't let him get traded to another team. Again, allegedly. So seeing how distraught her man was from work, Catherine attempted to put a hex on Al. I know. So the stress of his job would continue for years, seasons, but 1993 would be a good year for him because he would be released and signed with his former rivals, the Kansas City Chiefs. Not only that, but on June 26, 1993, after about five years of dating, Marcus and Catherine would get married in Brentwood, California, actually at the home of his friend and the person that many falsely called his mentor, O.J. Simpson. Now, Marcus said that they, quote, exchanged vows under the 
the canopy of two big trees in OJ's yard. Now this would mark a very happy moment in their lives, but you know things would change drastically the following year. So almost a year from when Marcus Allen of the Kansas City Chiefs and formerly of the Los Angeles Raiders married his wife Catherine, the absolute worst thing happened. Now you know what I'm talking about, but let's reflect on it from Marcus's perspective. So during an off-season work trip to the Cayman Islands, Marcus receives a phone call from his sister-in-law. Now you had to know that was serious because long distance charges in the 90s. Internationally at that? Yeah. No. So you know this was an emergency. But anywho, so she calls him to say that his dear friend, his wife's friend, the ex-wife of his friend of over 15 years, OJ Simpson, Nicole Brown Simpson, and a waiter named Ron Goldman were violently unalived outside of her townhome. Now, though his sister-in-law had no idea who committed the crime, Marcus would learn that they were speculating that his friend OJ was the one that did the unthinkable. Now, Marcus wrote in his autobiography that he was advised by his lawyer Ed Hook Stratton to stay in the island. So I guess that's why they weren't able to attend Nicole's funeral on June 16th, 1992. So when they finally made it back to Los Angeles, Marcus and Catherine did as much as they could to support OJ. Marcus wrote how they visited him in jail, talked with him on the phone, and told his defense attorneys that they would help however they could. But things took a turn. As Marcus returned to Kansas City for work, he began to hear the rumors. When LA County District Attorney Christopher Darden flew in to ask him questions, he asked if Marcus had an affair with Nicole and if he knew Faye Resnick. Now did he do what now? And what does the morally corrupt Faye Resnick have to do with anything? Now Marcus said of course he didn't have an affair with Nicole and yeah he knew Faye was Nicole's friend but what is this about? He wrote that quote, this was just the beginning of a whole new kind of nightmare. Because in October of 1994, just about four months after Nicole was unalive, Bay wrote a book called Nicole Brown Simpson, The Private Diary of a Life Interrupted. In that book, she spilled a lot of tea, allegedly. She alleged that Nicole told her that she had an affair with Marcus while Marcus was engaged to Catherine, but after Nicole was divorced or at least separated from OJ. And she also alleged that Marcus was packing, and I don't mean FedEx or UPS. Now, Marcus denied all of this, but the rumor began to run, okay? It was all over the news. It was all over the morning talk shows, the gossip shows, the National Enquirer. And mind you, this was in the days before the internet as we know it. So can you imagine? Now Marcus was concerned about how this allegation would impact his marriage, but felt solace, quote, in the knowledge that she was a strong person and that we'd both work diligently to make our marriage a solid one. But why would all of this come out? Like why would such a thing be said about the friend of both OJ and Nicole? Like something that could be so obviously damning and would damage the relationship between Marcus and Catherine. And hell, Marcus and OJ too. So why would anyone assume that Marcus Allen, the very good friend of OJ Simpson, would allegedly sleep with his ex Nicole? According to Marcus Allen's lawyer Ed Hook Stratton, quote, in building their defense, Simpson's lawyers obviously felt it would be beneficial if they could show that their client had not been jealous of Nicole in any relationship she might have had after they divorced. That's where all this crap about Marcus came into play. So you mean to tell me that Johnny Cochran would try to pull one black man down to save another? Allegedly? Oof. Well, Ed went on to say, quote, what angered me was the fact that all this was making Marcus and Catherine into two more victims in this awful mess. Marcus and Catherine tried to continue on as if this wasn't impacting them, but obviously it was. I mean, can you imagine the biggest story in the world has you as the main character in life for something you said never happened just to take the heat off someone you believed was your friend, your friend of decades, the person you've known since you were a boy becoming a man. 
The Allens would try not to let this disrupt them, but began to learn how to move more covertly. They didn't want the press and paparazzi aware of every coming and going. Can you imagine living this way for months or years, like having to check who is watching you at all times? And this was before ring cameras and like the height of surveillance of today. Like being cautious of people you meet because you're skeptical that they're gonna try to manipulate your interactions for clout. I know I would have ended up with an ulcer for sure. They would manage past it. I mean, in 1997, after 16 years of football, Marcus retired at the age of 37. He looked forward to settling into domestic life with Catherine and starting their family. He looked forward to one day having a little boy, but sadly that would not happen. Well, not with Catherine, because you see in 2001, they would actually divorce after about eight years of marriage. However, Catherine would marry again to Marcus's fellow chief's team mate Donnie Edwards. Now you probably saw her on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills some years back and hey look Marcus too would find companionship again later. Former running back Marcus Allen's divorce to ex-wife Catherine was finalized. He met a fitness trainer named Lauren Hunter. Now there is not a lot known about when they met however, but they met in a way that reminds you of that time. MySpace allegedly. After meeting, they would be seen out and about throughout the late 2000s and early 2000 teens. Now, 17 years after his autobiography was published, the dream of becoming a father to a little boy finally came to be. TMZ reported in 2014 that at the age of 53, Marcus and Lauren became the parents of their son, Drake Connor Allen. Now, I'm not sure how long their relationship continued after the birth of their son as Lauren was allegedly involved in some sort of relationship or texting situation between her and Baseball Hall of Fame nominee Alex Rodriguez. Yes, that A-Rod. This scandal occurred during his relationship to Jennifer Lopez and made it through several gossip papers and sites in 2017, but I honestly don't know Joe. And if I research this correctly, I think she might have rekindled a relationship with Marcus or at least have a solid co-parenting relationship with him. They both live in Metro Atlanta as they are raising their son out here. Now Marcus doesn't have seemed to remarried, but by looking at his Instagram account, he's a very proud father of Drake as he's frequently seen with him in many pictures on his grid. And that Outrunners concludes the love story of Marcus Allen. Now if you enjoyed this week's episode I would highly encourage you to read his autobiography Marcus the autobiography of Marcus Allen which details his childhood, his time at USC, the highs and lows of being in the pros including his decade plus sour relationship between the owner of the Los Angeles Raiders Al Davis. Now the links to his book plus other articles and videos I used in my research will be linked in the notes below. I hope you enjoyed this week's I'll Tell You What. What did you know about Hall of Famer Marcus Allen? Let me know in the comments below. Also, please subscribe here, follow us everywhere, and leave a podcast review regardless of where you get your I'll Tell You What stories. Check the links in the notes below if you want to support the show, grab some merch like this tea, or donate a coin or two. Thank you if you do. Now next week we're going to continue our football series with a former quarterback of my favorite franchise, Michael Vick. See you in the pews. It's about now.